We're back. We're live. We're at Think Tech Talks here on a given Wednesday in the one to two block with Eric Seitz, an, an attorney, a civil rights attorney. Uh, and we're here to talk about a case involving a, a murder of a, of a prostitute in, in Waikiki. The case has some moment. Excuse me, some intellectual interest to a civil rights attorney like Eric, especially uh, because uh, apparently um, this fellow is going to be tried in the military. He's going to get a court martial uh, rather than a, a civilian criminal trial. And that somehow makes a difference and it raises all kinds of issues and issues for counsel as well, public policy issues, issues for counsel. Welcome to the show, Eric. Thank you. Thanks for coming down. So what happened here in terms of the facts? What, what, what led to all of this? Well, my understanding is that the military defendant is a sergeant who was stationed uh, in Okinawa, or in Japan, I guess, and he was here on a temporary assignment, and it's alleged that he picked up this young woman in Waikiki and then killed her and dumped her body in Makaha. And uh, when... That's not across the state line or anything. No. When he was implicated in this, uh, apparently some sort of a deal was struck between the city and county Honolulu prosecutor's office and the Marine Corps at uh, Kaneohe Bay that the Marine Corps would assume jurisdiction. And it was a kind of surprising uh, announcement that that would be the case because there was nothing about this case which implicated the military in the facts other than the fact that the defendant himself is a member of the Marine Corps and typically that's not a basis for jurisdiction unless there are other considerations that weigh in favor of that. Mm -hmm. And it was somewhat surprising because historically the civilian courts have attempted to limit the jurisdiction and the reach of military courts into the civilian community and have wanted to uh, and have jealously guarded their jurisdiction when a military person commits a crime off-duty out in the community. But in this case, there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of speculation about why the case is being tried in the military, and I guess that's what we're going to discuss. Yeah, well, I'm very interested in that. Um, and, you know, and, and Hawaii has interest in that. We, we had the Massey case back in the 30s. We, we're still um, dealing with the Didi case, uh, the Secret Service uh, officer who was involved in a murder. Um, we've heard so much about Guantanamo and, and competing jurisdictions and, and prosecutorial approaches in Guantanamo. Um, right now, uh, there's, uh, there's a move to change the Uniform Code of Military Justice, uh, you know, with a sweeping revision of it. Um, so here we are with an age-old kind of distinction. Can you talk about the O'Callaghan case, which is a case, I think it's a Supreme Court case, that dealt with this very kind of jurisdictional issue? In the 1960s, um, O'Callaghan was stationed here in Hawaii at Fort Shafter. And he went out into Waikiki and he sexually assaulted a young woman in Waikiki and he was arrested and then he was immediately turned over to the army. The army court-martialed him and uh, over his objections he was tried and convicted, sentenced to I think a 10-year sentence and then he was dispatched to Fort Leavenworth where he was serving his sentence. At that point he contacted a very famous civil rights firm Rabinowitz, Boudin and Standard in New York and Victor Rabinowitz took on the case and took it all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court eventually decided that the military court in the O'Callaghan case did not have jurisdiction. That he should have been tried as a civilian so they vacated the conviction. And what they did was they created a doctrine which was implicit but never really discussed in the courts previously uh, of service connection. And they set out several different factors which the courts should look at and they basically said that even for military personnel, military courts should only assert jurisdiction in cases where there is a sufficient service connection to the offense charged. And you look at things like whether the, the person, the defendant, was on duty at the time, you look at where the offense occurred, you look to determine if the victim of the, defense, of the offense was also in the military, 
you look at whether there was an impact of this particular crime on the military service of any particular sort, and those kinds of factors. And um, in the O'Callaghan case, the Supreme Court decided there was really no service connection. There was no reason why the case shouldn't be tried. And the significance of that was at the time that the military courts are viewed as a disciplinary uh, process, not as a justice process. And everybody familiar with military justice, quote unquote, is aware of a saying that used to be bantered around, which was that military justice is to justice as military music is to music. <laughs> Heard and, it many times. And basically the concept was that the military courts functioned at the direction of higher officers. They performed services for the purpose of maintaining discipline and order in the military and that that wasn't necessarily consistent with providing constitutional rights and delivering justice in a particular case. So what's the difference between discipline and justice? Well, basically there may be needs to define offenses and discipline people and punish them for reasons that have nothing to do with the Constitution. For example, in, in the easiest kinds of cases, you look at what's called Article 134, which is an offense that's to the detriment of the military service. So you can do something and they make a decision that it brings the military service somehow into, into disrepute. One example was my client, Lieutenant Watata, who was tried and charged for making statements about the war in Iraq. Now those statements could not have been punished in civilian courts, but in military courts, they intended on punishing him for that and sending him to prison. So there are a whole range of considerations which the military finds to be detrimental to go to order and discipline, which would not even be offenses in the civilian courts. And then the jury is not an independent jury. The military jury is appointed by the convening authority who also brings the case and technically appoints the judge. There's so, kind of conflict in all of that. There are lots of conflicts built in and they're justifiable because this is a disciplinary action, not a justice proceeding. So all of those things happen. Now, o over the years, many practitioners have decided that there are significant advantages to being in the military system. For example, you have a preliminary hearing at which you can cross-examine witnesses and get an enormous amount of discovery that you can't get in criminal proceedings in the civilian courts. You have uh, all kinds of other procedural issues uh, you have sentencing requirements which in this day and age are much less stringent than what you have in the federal courts and in most state systems. So all of those things have a bearing on whether you want to be tried in a civilian court or in a military court and in some cases despite your misgivings about the ultimate fairness you might rather be in a military court because you have a better opportunity of getting a good outcome. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it's not that the defendant has a choice it's only that he can, and if he wants the benefit of it, must invoke the O'Callaghan doctrine. Yes. And, and essentially, if you read the Manual for Courts Martial, which is the Bible for uh, you show military, it military, like. this is not a military proceedings, this is, a, this is something that's been around for a long time. This is promulgated as an executive order by the president. And it implements the Code of Military Justice, which is a statute, and uh, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And under the manual for courts martial, basically the definition of the jurisdiction of, federal, of military courts is as broad as you can imagine. We can try any case anywhere involving anybody, including civilians. And the limits to that only come into play when somebody objects and then says you don't have jurisdiction. But if you don't object, they're going to proceed. I, as a civilian, can be tried. But if I object, that'll stop it. Well, it could. Uh, if you are accompanying uh, the military, for example, in Iraq or Afghanistan, and your uh, civilian contractor providing services, they can court-martial you under those circumstances. Now, for me, for example, uh, because of the nature of some of the cases, the controversial cases I've done, I've been threatened with contempt in some of these cases. I've never actually been uh, charged, but, uh, you know, query whether they could try me in a military court for contempt. They seem to think they could. It's never come to that. Why do I feel they'd have a headache trying? Well, I, I think so too, but they've never pursued it. 
But, you know, there are, there are certainly, uh, they hold it over the heads of civilian practitioners. If you're going to come into our court, then you don't abide by our rules. Then we're going to try you for anything you do that may be disrespectful. So they assert jurisdiction. I also had a case some years ago involving uh, a man who was charged with sabotaging an aircraft carrier, and all of that occurred in uh, Alameda in California. By the time they got ready to try the case, it had generated such publicity and controversy, and the boat by that time had been fixed and had sailed to Vietnam, where all the witnesses were. So they proposed to move this case, which had occurred in Alameda County, to, uh, to try it over in uh, the Philippines, at Subic Bay. And they did that also knowing that I couldn't go there because I was persona non grata at that point in the Philippines. So we ultimately went to federal court. We got a federal court judge to intervene, but to the, only to the extent that he told the Navy that unless Mr. Seitz can go there to represent his client because they have an attorney-client relationship, you can't move this case. But if you get him uh, safe passage, then they can move the case. Well, that's and, fair. Isn't it? Yeah, actually, that's it turned out, turned out to be fair, and it turned out even better for us because they did get me self, safe passage, but by the time that it all happened through diplomatic channels, the boat was on its way back, and we ended up trying the case in San Francisco. <laughs> now, yeah, okay. <laughs> but they asserted, and, and, and one of the cases cited in the manual uh, for the proposition, they asserted that they can try a case anywhere they want to in the world, and they do. And that case, the Chenoweth case, still stands for that proposition. It's a matter of policy, though, uh, and maybe you know, life in the military. The entire military establishment has changed. The, the military concept has changed in the last few years. But is there a public policy to support that no notion? Well, I think there is. There, you know, in, 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 the, in the 1960s, when the Vietnam War uh, was going on, uh, early on in that stage, the federal courts would not intervene and would not... Uh, supervise anything that happened in the military. If you tried to sue the military in federal court, the uniform response was, we're not going to tamper or interfere with what goes on there. It's a national defense. Right. And, and that's the same, that was the same just, justification that was given, by the way, for the Supreme Court when they refused to set aside the internment of the Japanese. It's a military decision. It's time of war. We're not going to uh, supervise what the military does. And that ideology prevailed. But after the Vietnam War and the, amid the controversy of the war, the federal courts began to soften their position. And so now all of a sudden the military was held accountable in places where they previously never had been. And that's essentially what led to the O'Callaghan decision in 1969. And since then, there's been a lot of uh, superintending and, and critiques of military decision making and military justice. And so the military is much more conscious because they're now under uh, more of a microscope when it comes to these kinds of cases. And so I, I think, in all fairness, you have to say to the military, they're much more careful, they're much more capable. The military judges, the military lawyers, generally speaking, are, are very capable of handling these cases and do a good job. And when people call me and ask for representation and want to pay me to represent them, more often than not, I tell them, you don't want to pay me. You've got a military lawyer who's just as capable as handling that case, and, and there's no reason for me to get involved. You say that after knowing who that lawyer is and making some value judgment on his, his, his ability. Yeah, typically. I mean, I tell them, look, you know, you go back and talk to your lawyer, and you ask your lawyer certain questions, and if you're satisfied that your lawyer is going to be aggressive and is going to defend you, as I would, then you really don't need me to come into a situation because that raises all kinds of other questions and issues, and you're better off having your military lawyer get a good outcome for you. Yeah, but you could say yes. He could hire you. His family could pay the bill, whatever, how that works. And he could have you as, what is it, individual counsel? And, yes. And then he could have the military lawyer as, what is it, appointed counsel? Yes. Uh, you can have a bunch of lawyers. Yes, and, and we do that to great success. You know, I, I um, in every case I've done, and I've done probably a thousand military cases over the years, or maybe even more, I have always had a co-counsel as a military lawyer. Because the military lawyer is there and knows what's going on, know the personalities, is uh, capable of getting information that I can't get as an as a outsider. Only in two circumstances or situations that I can recall did we end up dismissing the military lawyer because we felt that person wasn't acting in the client's best interest. But in all the other cases, I was thrilled with the participation and the role that those lawyers played. And so that's why I have no hesitation, generally speaking, advising mm -hmm. people 
check out your military lawyers first. And I suspect in this case in Kaneohe that there have been a number of things that have gone on as part of the calculus. What are the chances of getting a successful outcome? Uh, how am I going to be represented? Uh, how's this case going to be viewed by a military jury as opposed to a jury out in town? And those are the kinds of things would, which would go into deciding as a defendant whether or not you want to challenge the jurisdiction. I want to drill, drill down on that. I want to drill down on the convening authority considerations right after this break. Uh, that's Eric Seitz. He's a civil rights attorney here in Honolulu, handled a, a thousand military cases. Um, this is Think Tech Talks. We're talking about why exactly should a Waikiki murder go to court martial. I'm Jay Fidel. We'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone No. 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Horry. Mahalo. We're back. We're live. We're here at Think Tech Talks with Eric Seitz, a civil rights attorney here in Honolulu, talking about the Waikiki murder case and why it should go to a court martial instead of a civilian court here in Honolulu. So we talked about the O'Callaghan case, the United States Supreme Court that laid out a bunch of factors. It's one of those cases in the Supreme Court where they they give you guidelines, but in the end, everybody has to decide how those guidelines apply to a particular case. And so it, it's up to the courts that follow to provide the judicial gloss. What, what has happened in terms of a gloss for the O'Callaghan decision? Well, just two years later, in 1971, the Supreme Court looked at O'Callaghan again in a case involving a man who had committed two sexual assaults in New Jersey. In that case, he was a serviceman off duty. The victims were, I believe, both uh, civilians, but they were dependents of other military people. And the assaults happened on base. And in that case, the Supreme Court said the military court has jurisdiction because there are enough contacts with the service to warrant the military having a significant interest in the outcome and in handling the disciplinary case that followed from those incidents. Since that time, the lower courts have, as you say, picked at O'Callaghan and essentially gone in the direction of trying to broaden the jurisdiction of the military courts such but, that... And with national defense in mind. Yes, uh, and, and with some sort of national consistency. So O'Callaghan has been significantly undermined in terms of the breadth of that original doctrine but still, it's vibrant law, and my sense is that in this particular case in Waikiki with this Marine, if he were to challenge the jurisdiction, I think the military court, and if reviewed later, the civilian courts, would ultimately have a great deal of difficulty deciding that there's military jurisdiction here. But if he doesn't raise it, then the military is going to proceed, and they're going to try him, and he will have waived any objections. But is there a time on that? You know, sometimes you have a situation where if you want to make an objection, you have to do it before it's too late. Well, when is it too late for raising this objection? Well, that's not entirely clear, because generally speaking, the doctrine that we're all taught in law school is you can challenge jurisdiction any time. But I think in this case, where it's a, it's a question of a choice of courts, my belief is that if he doesn't raise it in the military court, and give the military court an opportunity to decide whether it has jurisdiction or not, that later reviewing courts are going to say, too late, you're out of luck, you're stuck, you took your chances, you don't like what you got, it's too late now to raise it. I, I, I thoroughly suspect... So the latches, an equitable delay latches type of defense. Yeah, I think that's probably going to be the case. I certainly, if I wanted to challenge jurisdiction, would not let it lay and then wait till the outcome just to see if I'm satisfied. But it's not too late right now today because this only happened, what, a month ago or so? It's not too late until he's tried and convicted, in my view. Mm. And so I think, you know, what's going on here is they've made a conscious decision that he's going to probably get a better shot, mostly, I think, at the outcome in a military court. I think, you know, originally when this case came up and I was asked, I was very concerned 
that a military court can give the death penalty. And of course, in Hawaii, there is no death penalty in the civilian courts. So uh, I would have been very concerned at that point, from that standpoint, that I would want to have my case tried in the civilian courts. But apparently the military, early on, and maybe as part of whatever deal they made with uh, Keith Kaneshiro, uh, said they were not going to ask for the death penalty. So with that in mind, then, if I were this sergeant, he goes to a military trial, he's going to be tried for killing a prostitute. Ideologically, the military has never had a high view of prostitutes. They don't equate prostitutes with victims of other kinds, uh, which I think is disgraceful, but nevertheless, the reality is that he could get a sentence, even if he's convicted of murder, of maybe 8, 10, or 12 years. And that's a whole lot less if he went to trial in the Hawaii state courts, where if he were convicted, he would get a life sentence with parole. So let's, let's um, look at the various deciding, deciding entities on the table. At the moment the decision is made to move him to a, federal, to a, a military court, and at this, the moment the decision is made by him and his counsel not to object to that, at least not so far. What, what was going through the mind of the convening authority, I mean, in your imagination anyway, uh, when he decided he was going to you know, issue a charge sheet on this and convene a court-martial? Well, I think the convening authority probably was saying, this is our mess, this is our guy. We want first crack at disciplining him. If we turn him over to uh, the state, and he's prosecuted in the state courts, we have no control over the situation at all. None. And that's always a dilemma, for example, overseas. The military commanders overseas are very loath to turn over military people to uh, the Japanese courts or the Filipino courts or any place else. Lose control. Because they lose control. And it's terrifying for members of the service to think that they're going to languish in a prison in some other place, in Thailand or wherever else where they're being convicted. Uh, and it would have a significant detriment uh, on the morale and, and uh, discipline in the military ranks of, with the rest of other people. And so, you know, that they fight those things. Often if something happens, for example, in Okinawa or the Philippines, they immediately take the guy and put him on a plane and send him home which has caused uh, all kinds of diplomatic crises in mm. some of those countries mm. and has resulted in people having to come back. Mm, wow. Because there are treaty agreements in all of those countries, what we call status of forces agreements, where the military has agreed that if somebody commits a crime out in town, that person will be tried and will be turned over to the local authorities. But now, that's a matter of negotiating with a specific country and it's a specific treaty for each country. Yes. And we don't have those kinds of agreements in this country. But if uh, this sergeant were going to be tried in the civilian courts, a number of things would have happened. First of all, he would have been held in pretrial confinement in a state prison, which is not a particularly nice environment to spend months or years waiting for your trial. Uh, the circumstances there are not a whole lot different whether you've been convicted or whether you're in pretrial confinement. You're in a, in a prison with nothing to do with some degree of, uh, of danger because of the nature of the prison environment. Mm -hmm. Whereas in a military brig, which is where he is now at uh, Pearl Harbor, there are just a handful of people there and it's just like being in basic training. It's a little bit spartan, but there's no threat. There's no danger there at all. Secondly, uh, he would have to obtain counsel. Uh, if he were indigent, he would be appointed a public defender as a civilian in the civilian courts or be able to hire his own civilian attorney. He may be getting a civilian attorney as a public defender who's not that experienced, although I, I think, frankly, the public defender's office here does a great job for the most part, especially in serious cases. But he doesn't know that, and there's some hesitancy on the part of military personnel to want to accept a lawyer in a community where you have no roots. So uh, if I were he, you know, he would want to get a military lawyer who he would think would be more capable of representing him in a military court-martial where these people are experienced and, and very capable. Um, then, you know, you go to trial, and as I said, then you look at what the chances are. Well, maybe you have a better chance of being acquitted in a civilian court because the jury has to decide unanimously, whereas in a military court it doesn't have to be unanimous, only two-thirds. On the other hand, if you're convicted in a military court, the same jury that convicts you is the, is the, makes the determination as to punishment. And if, as I said earlier, you think that military officers are, are 
going to be more sympathetic, given the nature of the crime and the victim, than what would happen to you where the punishment is, uh, is very serious uh, under civilian laws, then you might opt to be tried in, uh, in the military court for that reason alone. And I suspect those are the kinds of considerations that have gone into this decision here. You know, this reminds me of Didi. I mean, it's an irresistible connection a reference. Um, in the Didi case, uh, I mean, I know this because I talked to some federal officials at the time it was first being characterized, as, and they said that, uh, gee whiz, they were concerned for Didi being in state custody. They were concerned for Didi being prosecuted, uh, you know, in, in a state that would not be um, very sympathetic uh, to him vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the victim um, and that he would he was going to get a bad time and he should be treated with he would be treated much better uh, if he was in the federal system and it was surprising that he didn't get into the federal system one way or the other um, but I think the federal establishment felt that this was akin to you know an experience in a foreign country uh, and that he was going to get shafted if he if he ran ran the gamut in the local process well uh, you know frankly I do not understand why immediately his lawyers did not ask to remove the case to federal court. They missed the, they missed the timeline for that, and that's the only reason it was denied. Yeah. Uh, I, I would have moved it to federal court right away. Now, you know, when you do that, you are in effect saying to the civilian community, the same community from which federal jurors would be drawn, we don't trust you to do justice here, and, and you've got to live with that statement. On the other hand, I would have much preferred to be in federal court if I were his attorney. Now. Now, despite that, as and as I think it it, it played out, there's no question that Didi uh, fared well in the state court, and the judge, uh, I think, basically, and the prosecutor, did not do a particularly good job, and he ended up with a mistrial. Uh, I think if he'd been uh, given a, a <laughs> and instruction so it worked well for him. Yeah, just, even though it was a, a mis I mean, a mistake. <laughs> I, I think so. I mean, basically, if there had been a uh, a manslaughter instruction, I, I firmly believe he would have been convicted of manslaughter, uh, which would have been a very serious uh, event for him because then he would have been sentenced to twenty yeah, the years. The all or nothing thing was not a good strategy for the prosecutor. N not at all. And normally, the prosecutor doesn't want that. So in this case, there are lots of questions about Didi, but the considerations in terms of whether you want to be tried in one place or another certainly did seem to be very one-sided in terms of getting him out of state courts. Yeah. Do you think the convening authority here was thinking that I'm going to protect my man? He's, he's part, you know, I'm a Marine, he's a Marine. I want to protect my Marines and keep him away from harm in the state courts. Absolutely. I don't think there's any quest, question that in all of these cases, the military commander wants to take control and wants to assert the control as broadly as he or she can. Everyone loves jurisdiction. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, 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 you know, everybody has the view that I don't trust some other jurisdiction to do the right thing better than I will. And you, you may disagree with what their considerations are and their ultimate objectives are, but in terms of exercising that authority, every jurisdiction thinks that it can do it better. And in this case, these military commanders certainly did not want to cede jurisdictional and disciplinary authorities to the state over people who were in their command. So he went willingly. And, and he had a civilian lawyer at the time. I don't really know the, what happened there. I don't know if who he Who made the decision for him to go willingly? Well, uh, presumably, the decision was made in some sort of agreement between the prosecutor, Keith Kaneshiro, and the commander out at uh, the Marine Corps base at Kaneohe. And once that decision was made, as soon as the matter was convened on the military base, it then became the question of the defendant to challenge it. And to the best of my knowledge, they have never done so. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. He was not directly involved in the decision to put it in the, in the court-martial. And wh whoever is representing him is not really raising the issue now. And I wonder if he had raised the issue and the state, and the state prosecutor felt differently about it, wanted it tried in the state. Um, sounds to me from the discussion up to this point, the state prosecutor would have a, a hard time um, in denying the nexus of the of the military. Um, well, maybe not. No, I think in this case, if Kaneshiro had wanted to try the case in state court, it would have stayed there. And he would have argued that uh, there's no nexus. Uh, 
Oh, oh, I'm, I got it wrong. Huh? Uh, he would have argued. What would he have argued in order to have it stay in the state court under well, O'Callaghan? Well, basically, he would have argued that uh, this guy was off duty. The victim was off duty. The crime occurred in our community. Had no connection with the military at all, and so we have jurisdiction. And the military would have had no basis to to contest that, had that been the initial decision by the state authorities. Uh, and nor would the guy, the defendant, have any basis to uh, contest that jurisdiction. Once the state decided to charge him, he was there. Yeah. And they had they had the body, they had control over it, and they weren't going to give it up unless uh, something happened by way of some sort of a political deal. And that's precisely what occurred. There was some sort of a deal between the prosecutor's office and the Marine Corps. And from, this, from the prosecutor's standpoint, uh, it may very well have been just simply that we don't want to spend the money prosecuting this case. This is a murder case. It's going to cost us a lot of time and money. If the military is willing to do it and is going to do it, then, hey, let them have them. Yeah. And maybe he was worried, too, about having another DD kind of experience. I, I, I don't think so, because the, if you go to court any day here, either in the district court or in the circuit courts, you'll see military people on trial charged with misdemeanors, traffic offenses, drunk driving, felonies. Lots of military people get in trouble off base, and there's no tug of war as to what happens to them. They're basically tried in the civilian courts. The only tug of war occurs on some occasions when the cases drag on and the, and the military people are supposed to be deployed, but even that gets worked out. Okay, <clears throat> it's really interesting. Eric Seitz, uh, civil rights attorney. We're here on Think Tech Talks. We're talking about why should a Waikiki murder go to court martial? And it's looking like there's some good reasons for that. We'll be right back after this break for more. You're probably wondering why we've called you here today. There are things in the world you just got to get your head around. I know for one, it's a lot of work. Thank God that there is a place where I can go and hear meaningful dialogue over my screen. Think tech. Be there or be illiterate. We're back. We're live with Eric Seitz, a civil rights attorney here in Honolulu on Think Tech Talks. I'm Jay Fidel. We're talking about this recent case in Waikiki where uh, a military man murdered a, uh, uh, a prostitute. And, He's charged and, with murder. Pardon me. Pardon me. Uh, I, I was just testing you, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the civil rights attorney would never let me get away with that. <laughs> where, where this fellow was charged with murdering a, a prostitute in, in uh, Waikiki. And he's going to a court martial. So, what's going to happen now in the court martial, Eric? Can you give us a precy about how it will how it will go? Well, I, I don't know the scheduling, but presumably the next thing that'll happen is they will convene a court martial. They probably already have uh, what they call a convening order, which lists the members of the court martial who are going to comprise the military jury, and uh, it'll be then like any other trial. Um, there are a minimum of five people who uh, need to be on the panel. It's a general court martial. At a general court martial. Because it's capital, I mean, it's a serious felony. Right. Serious cases are in front of a general court martial. Right. Uh, typically, for a general court martial, you have somewhere between eight and 12 members. Uh, and uh, they will go through a process which is very similar from that standpoint to a uh, civilian trial. Prosecution will present its case defense will present its case, the uh, panel will deliberate and decide whether or not to convict. As I said earlier, they only need two-thirds, they don't need uh, a unanimous outcome. If they get two-thirds, then he's convicted. If they get less than that, then he's acquitted. If they convict him, then they will move on to the second stage, which is the punishment stage, and the same juror, military jurors will then hear evidence and come up with a determination as to what the punishment be. And, and the punishment in a murder case is likely to include a dishonorable discharge and some period of time in confinement, uh, and then he'll be reduced in rank to the lowest uh, pay grade. Uh, and in, in the military for a murder case, uh, I think he can be uh, sentenced to up to life. I'm not sure. It, it is certainly, uh, it, when it's not a death 
penalty but case. But there are, there are death penalty cases in the Uniform Code. Yes. This is just not one of them? Is that the yes. idea? Yes. The, 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 the Commandant of the Marine Corps has to make a decision of whether or not he wants to seek a, a death penalty. And if he decides to do so, then the rules are changed, actually. Because then, instead of two-thirds, you need three-quarters of the jury. Uh, then you also have automatic appeals, which you don't necessarily have uh, if it's just referred as a normal felony murder case. Mm -hmm. So the case will go to trial. Uh, the case will be reviewed at several different levels. The guy will go off to prison, probably at Fort Leavenworth, which is where Army uh, convicted felons are, are held. Uh, he will serve time. He will the have... Marines a, too? Yes. Okay. He will have access to um, uh, various clemency proceedings along the way. Uh, and uh, he will have access to a parole proceeding. Uh, and uh, in theory, he might get out earlier than what his sentence is, depending upon what emerges and what's presented. But my best estimate, as I said earlier, is he's not going to get a life sentence, which is what he would get in state court if he were convicted of a second-degree murder. He's likely to get a sentence of somewhere maybe as low as 10 to 12 years and maybe as high as 20 years. And he would serve significantly less than either of those amounts. One thing that strikes me, you described the procedure, it's, it seems so cut and dry, it seems like it would be faster than a state court procedure. Am I right about that? You've been in both. So. Yes. It is faster, and one reason it's faster is because court martials are not sitting courts. So anytime there's an offense, the commanding officer, the convening authority, creates a court by an order. And once that case is done, that court goes away. It doesn't exist anymore. So this court martial only has one case. They don't have other cases, and they don't have to worry about juggling their docket. The judge may have other cases because he's got a caseload and other circumstances, but there's only one case before this group of people, and that makes it possible to move much, much more quickly than we move in civilian courts. Gee, I wonder if that could be used in civilian courts. I know it's a little late for this conversation, <laughs> but it sounds like a good system. Well, you know, I mean, in actuality, I think most lawyers will tell you that criminal cases in civilian courts move pretty quickly, too, because they're given priority in docketing mm -hmm. from the federal and the state courts. Mm -hmm. And that's why there are very few lawyers who do both civil and criminal cases, because the criminal cases tend to take priority and move very quickly. What about the plea bargain process? I mean, you see that everywhere in American justice, at least in non-military American justice. Is that is that likely to happen? Is it as likely to happen here in a military court martial? More likely. Mm. A high percentage of cases uh, get disposed of uh, by plea bargains. Now, that too is a very regulated process in the military. Um, the process of a plea bargain has to be initiated by the defendant and his or her counsel. It can't be initiated by the government. You come to an agreement, not, not with the government lawyers, but with the convening authority who has to agree to it. And then if you have a plea bargain, you go to court and the judge conducts a very substantial inquiry to determine whether or not the plea bargain is provident. And I've had lots of problems where pleas have not been accepted because the judges are convinced that it's not a proper or a just the, the, the defense just doesn't outcome. really understand no or or it just doesn't like the outcome, frankly. Yeah, of, uh, of the agreement. Yes. Uh, if, if the penalty is too harsh or Correct. Maybe, maybe too, yeah. And in some cases, you can go to trial, you can agree upon a plea bargain, and you go to trial anyway, and that basically just sets a maximum. And so if the jury, military jury comes back with an outcome which is less than what you agreed to and is more favorable to the defendant, that's what you end up getting. But sometimes you do that, for example, where witnesses are unavailable, you agree to plead, and uh, therefore they don't have to call certain witnesses or they wouldn't be able to call otherwise. There are lots of ways that plea bargains can be tailored to a situation. More often than not, they do set a cap on what the amount of incarceration would be. This, this is in the military. Yeah. In a civilian, if you, if you, you can't play one against the other. It no. doesn't act as a cap. No. It goes out the window if you, if you insist on going to trial. That's correct. Yeah. Hmm. So, I mean, here we have these two competing systems. 
and the considerations flow, and uh, the convening authority will have his lawyers tell him, uh, you know, what the considerations are for him. You'll have the defendant, uh, he'll be making his choice, and apparently they both made the same choice here. Um, I just wonder, you know, but the O'Callaghan thing sort of overshadows all of this because had he wished to go to a, a civilian trial, he could have done that pretty clear. Um, in this case. In this, in yeah. this case. In yes. this case. But yes. I just wonder if there's any sea change we ought to know about, we ought to talk about, especially in Hawaii, you know, in the backdrop of the Massey case and the Didi case and the fact that we have, you know, all the military bases here and the military forces here. And, and also in view of the fact that we have this jurisdictional discomfort over Guantanamo for the past, what, uh, 10 plus years. Um, where, where does this case fit? Does it mean anything beyond what you've just described in sea change? I don't think this case does, but there is still a lot of discomfort and controversy about Guantanamo. Guantanamo, after all, involves civilians. Civilians are being held by the United States government, and the United States government has asserted its right to try them in military tribunals under circumstances which, from a civil rights perspective, are simply atrocious. Um, and so. You know, as long as the military continues to broaden its jurisdiction and to assert that broad jurisdiction, there are going to be inevitable problems uh, in our jurisprudence. And so it always behooves, I think, civilians to limit the military. We, now, you know, for example, we have another whole series of concerns. We have this old posse comitatus doctrine where the military uh, police officers and investigators would go out in the community and would conduct searches and participate in arrests and do all kinds of things, even though statutorily they're forbidden from doing so. And for those of you, for example, as I did last night, watch NCIS, <laughs> which is course. a total complete fabrication. <laughs> you see these naval uh, investigative officers going out in the community and conducting all kinds of investigations, terrorizing and arresting civilians. And they can't do that. They flatly cannot do that. And uh, I've tried uh, posse comitatus cases here in Hawaii where military people have gone out and overstepped their jurisdiction. And it is always a concern, especially in a place like Hawaii, where one time Hawaii was under martial law. Posse right, comitatus. That's another backdrop point, you know, special to Hawaii. Military authority is always suspect and always needs to be constrained and limited because of the fact that it Im implicates limitations on civil liberties. Now, having said that, if the military keeps to its own jurisdiction and maintains appropriate limits, there are significant advantages to try cases in the military system. One other thing just occurs to me in the course of this conversation, so much so that I'm going to skip the break, <laughs> and that is Snowden. Now, why? You know, Snowden obviously is a civilian, but Snowden is working for a military contractor who is essentially part of the military, um, doing military things, doing intelligence things. Uh, and I mean, the sea change on that level is that the military has given up a lot of the functionality that it was performing, say, in World War II, to contractors, lots of contractors everywhere. You mentioned that if this uh, kind of thing had happened in a war zone, uh, you know, then the court, of, court of, the court of military justice might have applied against uh, Snowden, but I guess it doesn't apply here. And I just wonder how you see this as uh, against the sea change of the way military functionality is performed in the 21st century. Uh, the Snowden case is interesting from a lot of respects, but as I understand it, he's been indicted in Virginia in the federal district court there. So presumably because the agencies that were responsible for the work that he was doing are located in Virginia, they found that the, that's the location of where they should indict him. Secretly, I was hoping he'd be indicted here, and I made it known I'd be happy to represent him. <laughs> but nothing lo has come about from that. <laughs> but uh, the military would not, I think, have any jurisdiction, would not want to assert jurisdiction over Snowden if he were ever returned and faced a trial. Um, there was uh, that same issue about a young man, and I'm trying to remember his name, who was arrested in Afghanistan, who was an American civilian, who was returned to the United States and pled guilty and was tried in Washington, D.C. 
uh, and I, his name escapes me. But typically with Americans, they are very careful to ensure that those cases are tried in federal courts up to now. Now there may, you know, be a time, and we've heard, you know, rumors about the fact that certain people in uh, Sudan and other places were Americans who've gone there to fight because they may be uh, from Sudan originally or other places like well, that. Who knows where? In Minneapolis, yeah, you know? Exactly. Like, you know. That some of those people, if they're ever apprehended, might very well find themselves treated as war criminals and be put in uh, Guantanamo. <laughs> but that hasn't happened, and my hope is that that whole approach to treating people will be limited and not be expanded in any manner. One thing I want to clarify, and that is, you say in the, in the Snowden case he was indicted in the federal district court. Well, that's not a court martial. No. But if there was, um, you know, if there was a nexus, right? Uh, if he somehow came within the jurisdiction of the Code of Military Justice, uh, would the same kind of analysis apply between the court martial and the federal court rather than the state court? Yes. Mm -hmm. You still have to have service connection yeah. under under Callahan versus Parker. Yeah. So those same tests would still be viewed if there were a contest and an argument over jurisdiction. We all know that uh, you know Guantanamo was a failure legally. Uh, I mean, it's, it's fell apart a long time ago. A disaster. A disaster. Okay. Shameless. Um, but um, you know, the, I guess the question is, going forward, uh, are we are we going to have um, all these cases that uh, Bush, uh, President Bush, tried to? try in, in Guantanamo, we're going to have them in the federal district court. I mean, if, if it should happen again, if we go overseas the way we went into, say, Afghanistan, it should happen again, what's going to happen to the people we capture there who we, we see as adversaries? Well, you know, in today's world, ideally, people whom we capture should be tried in an international court. Yes. But the United States is not a signatory to uh, the United Nations Compact with regard to that. So you don't see any people the United States catches being transported to Brussels for trials there. But ideally, that would seem to make the greatest sense. Um, you know, you have people from the Bush administration who are still credible sources. One of them sits on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, who are saying essentially, and have always maintained that uh, if the president sees a threat to the United States that he has implicit authority to arrest people and hold them and punish them as he sees fit until the threat is abated. And as long as that is the ideology, uh, you're going to have internment of groups, you're going to have military courts trying civilians, and you're going to have the kinds of threatened uh, disasters which we had in Guantanamo. And I, I, for one, think that uh, because of the unwillingness of the current political administration and the courts to s immediately dismantle and, and, uh, and critique what's happened in Guantanamo, that the likelihood of it reoccurring and persisting for a long time is very great. Well, assuming that one day soon it is dismantled, it doesn't sound like there's politically or legally there's much of a chance that it'll somehow, this kind of prisoner will be wrapped under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Uh, although, I mean, there is, there is an argument that can be made along those lines. That's just not going to happen. And the international courts would be a better solution, but that may not happen too quickly either. So where are they going to go? I don't know where they're going to go. It's a mess right now. You have some people being tried in federal courts, other people being consigned to Guantanamo. The Congress went back and forth. The courts went back and forth on, on how those people should be handled. Uh, you ended up with some 700 people, I think, originally in Guantanamo. Uh, all but uh, about 150 of them have now been released because it was determined that they really were not culpable for what they were originally being held. I mean, that's just an incredible disgrace. We talk about all these people in the state courts who were wrongly convicted who are now being freed because of DNA. These are people who are held in Guantanamo in the worst conditions who were never even found guilty of anything. And, and it would be hard to find them guilty. And it would be. If the lack of real evidence, and if you apply any standard of evidence, um, you know, there is no evidence. So that's why I think it always behooves us to be guarded and suspicious when the military asserts jurisdiction and authority. 
That's not to say the military shouldn't be allowed to assert its authority in a number of different situations where the military has a clear interest, uh, as the Supreme Court said in the O'Callaghan case. But absent those te stringent tests, my belief is it's always better to refer matters to the civilian courts because at least you have some rules and some protections there which you can rely upon to some degree. We live in interesting times, Eric. We do. Eric Seitz, uh, a civil rights attorney here in Honolulu. It's been Think Tech Talks. We've been talking about why should a Waikiki murder go to a court martial. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you. Aloha.